So our goal for the last several videos has been able to, to develop a technique for which we can graph various functions without the need of a graphing utility of any kind. And it works really great when we have graph transformations. If we know a basic graph, we can shift it, we can stretch it, we can compress it, we can reflect it. We can handle those things fairly well by now. Uh, but there are some functions that are a lot more complicated for which transformations are insufficient for our purposes. Like take the function g of x equals x to the 2 thirds times x minus 2 to the 1 third. This function here, we're not going to be able to graph it via transformations alone. Now, in previous videos for this lecture 48, we talked about the idea of end behavior and how dominant terms come into play to determine the end behavior. Uh, asymptotically, our function could look like an exponential. It could look like a power function or something in that, in that direction. And so dominance then helps us know that the, as we go to the far left and the far right of the graph, then our, our function will asymptotically look like a simple function, like a power function or exponential, what have you. But we don't have any information yet about what happens in the middle. Um, if we had a function like y equals, say, x squared times x minus 2, something like this, we actually had some experience with this. Like, okay, asymptotically, this is the same thing as x cubed. Great. But we also knew things about the x-intercepts, right? You have an x-intercept at x equals 0. You have an x-intercept at 2. At x equals 0, it'll touch infinity. And at x equals 2, it'll, excuse me, at x squared, because of it, because of the x squared, the multiplicity will will cross the x axis at two and will touch the x axis at zero right there. So you get a graph that looks something like the following, right? So we have the asymptotic behavior of x cubed. It goes up on the right, it goes down on the left. But then in the middle, near the x-intercepts, we know whether it touches or crosses. So we could use, in addition to the in behavior, we can use the asymptotics of the intercepts. That is what happens near the x-intercepts, right? And so as we studied this for polynomial graphs, say we have a polynomial function like the following, f of x equals x minus the first root to the m1 times x minus r2, the second root to m2, the second multiplicity, all the way down to the nth root, x minus rn to the mn. And so each of these cases, r1, r2, rn, these are the roots of the polynomial, the x-intercepts of the graph. And then these m's here, were the multiplicities, right? And so a strategy we mentioned earlier is that asymptotically, as x approaches its x-intercept here, that is, as x approaches ri, the function will be approximately, f of x will be approximately, it'll look like c times x minus ri to the mi for some coefficient c. Now, how do you find that coefficient? Well, you're just going to plug in x equals ri for all of the x's, with one exception, you don't plug it in for the i for the ri spot because otherwise you get zero. So you plug in x equals zero everywhere else, and then you can see that our function will look approximately the same thing as a shifted power function in this in this regard. Some try, 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 some transform power function for which we can then we can then graph those type of things. So in other words, as x is closer and closer to an intercept, the graph will closely resemble these power functions with transformations in play, for which the multiplicity will help us determine how does the power function behave, right? If it was even, you touch the x-axis, be it in cross. If it was odd, you would cross the x-axis. So that we've learned about that before. Um, with reciprocal functions, there could be vertical asymptotes in play. Like if we were trying to graph y equals, let's say, x minus 1 to the negative 1 power, that could be rewritten as 1 over x minus 1. And so it's like, oh, that looks like the reciprocal graph where you have x in, uh, have a vertical asymptote. It would look something like this, right? But you've shifted it to the right by 1. We could do those ones as well. What I want to focus on in this video, because we've done that with we've done that with the reciprocal functions and the monomial functions, what happens if you have like a fractional exponent, like 2 thirds and 1 third? Well, then we have to figure out, well, what does the graph y equals x to the, say, a over b power, what does that look like in general for a fraction? Okay, let's say your multiplicity m turned out to be a fraction a, b. Well, the first thing to do is you want to write that fraction in lowest terms. If a and b have any common divisors, crush them, take them out, and simplify it. So if you had something like 2 fourths, you're going to replace it with 1 half instead. Okay, put it in lowest terms. So when the numerator a is odd, right? When a is odd, that means that your graph is going to cross the x-axis at that root. Just like we saw with monomial functions, you cross the x-axis. With the reciprocal functions, we said that we would cross infinity. Our spaceship would fly off the screen and wrap around from the other side. 
when a is an even number, the graph is going to touch the x-axis at that root. We saw that when we had even monomials like x squared. We also saw that when you had like even uh, reciprocals like one over x squared, that you have your vertical asymptote and you would touch infinity. So you touch at the same side and, and, and you, instead of wrapping around the other way. So we've seen that before. So if the numerator is odd, you cross. If the numerator is even, you touch. That pattern is consistent with what we've already seen before, okay? But it turns out there is another thing we have to pay attention to. We have to look at M itself. When M is a big number, that is it's bigger than one, right? So that could be like it's it's like two, three, or four, like, a, like an integer. But we could also take something like five halves or say six fifths or you know seven thirds things like that we could still have a fraction that's bigger than one if your fraction is bigger than one what that tells us is that the graph will become flat near the root okay and the concavity it'll concave away from the x from the x-axis in that regard so what i mean is when your when your m is bigger than one it's going to be kind of like the following if you're odd, you might cross and you get something like this. So it's flat near the x-intercept and the concavity is going away from the x-intercept. Uh, from the x -intercept. If it was an even graph though, you might get something like the following, right? It gets flat. It gets flat near the x-intercept and concavity goes away from the x-axis there. And then the bigger M is, the flatter it gets, right? It's the flatter uh, the bigger M is. Okay, so that's that's pretty nice. Now let's say that your your multiplicity is between zero and one, and I mean it could be negative, but if it's negative, it's not an x-intercept; it's a vertical asymptote. So you do everything accordingly that way. So we're just focused on the absolute value here. If the absolute value here of m is between zero and one, it's a small number. Let, let's say like it was like one half or one third, or maybe it was like three fourths, something small, right? It's less than one. The graph then instead will become steep near the root. So it's going to be really, really steep. That is, the graph will concave towards the x-axis. Uh, when the graph crosses the x-axis steeply, we say that the graph has unusual steepness, right? It's going to be very, very, very steep, okay? And so one possibility is you get something like the following. Let's say that your, let's say that you have your, your fraction here, m, a over b, we're going to have that a is odd, a is odd, but M is less than one here. In that situation, you would expect that your graph is going to be steep, right? Uh, we want we we don't want it to be flat like these pictures we had before. We want it to be steep, right? So we get something like this. So the, their steepness, right? It's it, when you look really point the point it gets steep, and then the closer and closer you get to zero, the more steep it becomes. Notice the concavity in this situation. The concavity is pointing towards the x-axis, okay? That's if, you're, that's if you're odd, you have this unusual steepness, right? On the other hand, if you're even, if you're even, you get the same picture, right? That it should be, it should be very steep as you get towards the x-intercept, the concavity should be pointing down, but you're only touching the x-axis, you can't cross it. So you have to get something like the following, right? For which it's steep near the intercept, but it should be concave down towards that is concave towards the x-axis. In this situation, your unusual steepness actually looks like a cusp, right? Because you get this thing, let me kind of remove the x-axis there. Whoops, I'll just draw it a little bit higher. You get this like sharp corner right here, it's a cusp. So as you're looking through homework problems, they often refer to this even steepness, this is called a cusp, but if it's odd, they might refer to it as like unusual steepness. It's really, really steep uh, as you get close to the x-intercept. And so that, with that difference in mind, we're now ready to start graphing functions that kind of look like polynomials, uh, but we might have fractional powers in play here. So this example, we have g of x equals x to the two-thirds times x minus two to the one-third. So things I can detect very quickly. So as we look at this one, we're going to get an x-intercept at zero, and we have a multiplicity of two-thirds. Some things to notice here about m. m is less than one, right? And the numerator is even, right? The numerator is even here. That means we're gonna to touch the x-axis. We touch the x-axis, but because m is less than one, this needs to be steep, right? So the end that tells us our graph is gonna have a cusp at x equals zero, all right? Uh, let's look at the other factor. If we look at x minus two to the one-third power, that tells me that I'm having an x-intercept at two, Okay, 
Um, the multiplicity there is one third, which you'll notice one third is also less than one. So that tells us that this thing is likewise going to be steep. But because the numerator is odd, we see that it's going to cross. It's going to cross the x-axis. And so we're going to refer to this as uh, unusual steepness. Unusually steep. Uh, unusually steep. That's that's how we're going to describe this thing. So that's going to be the behavior near the x-intercepts. What is the what's the asymptotic behavior? Notice if we only look at the leading terms, we get x to the two thirds, and we get x to the one third. Asymptotically, as we go towards infinity or negative infinity, this will look like two x to the two thirds times x to the one third. Which adding the powers together, you get x to the three thirds, which is equal to x itself. And so this tells me that our function will be asymptotic to a line. That is, there's going to be an oblique asymptote. Uh, oblique. An oblique asymptote at y equals x. Okay? And so let's put this information together. Right? I'm going to have the, the finish picture on the left-hand side, and then we're going to draw it on the right-hand side here to kind of show you what's happening. So if we put our x-axis here, and our y-axis here. I'm not going to draw this thing perfectly to scale, but what we anticipate is, like we said, there is an x-intercept at zero and an x-intercept at two. At, and then we have this, this asymptote, this asymptotic behavior at y equals x, which is this diagonal line that looks something like the following. All right, we have this asymptotic behavior. Um, we might actually want to figure out whether we cross the asymptote or not. I'm not going to worry about it in that in this situation, though. Let's just go with the information we have. So that we know that at x equals 0, there's going to be a cusp. So the question is, is it going to be a cusp like this, or is it going to be a cusp like this? We see on the picture that it should be down on the downside, but how do we know that, right? We'll come back to that in a second. Uh, we also know that at, we also know that at um, x equals 2, there should be unusual steepness. So it should either look like this, like the picture suggests, or it should go the other way around. How do we know which one is which? Well, like I said, we could figure out when does our function, does it ever cross our horizontal asymptote or not? Uh, another approach is actually just to plug into our function, right? We have our function f of x equals, remember, x to the 2 thirds times x minus 2 to the 1 third. What happens if I plug in, you know, what happens when x approaches 0 right here? Well, what this means is you're going to get, f here will be approximately the same thing. It'll be approximately the same thing as x to the 2 thirds times 0 minus 2 to the 1 third, like so. So this thing will be the same thing as negative the cube root of 2 times x to the 2 thirds. So the, the reason this matters here is the sign, right? This has a negative coefficient. So that means instead of looking like x to the 2 thirds, which has that cusp, it's been reflected down. So our cusp is going to go downward. That's what we care about right there. So having x approach 0 tells us that it should be reflected downward. So the cusp should be pointing up like we see right here. Okay, so that honestly is enough information to finish the rest of the picture uh, because we can see that from here, I'm going to have to come towards my, my, my x-intercept passing through it like that, and then you're going to approach your asymptote after that. But if you wanted to, you could do it at the other x-intercept as well. As x approaches 2, what happens? Well, our function will be asymptotically the same thing as 2 to the 2 thirds times x minus 2 to the 1 third, like so. You'll notice in this situation that the coefficient is positive. That's all that matters. We want to know is there a reflection that we reflect across the x-axis. Since it's a positive coefficient, there's no reflection. So it should look like the standard function, which looks like this. The reflected form would look something like that. So we then get our picture uh, for this one right here. Let's look at another example. In this example, let's consider the function g of x equals the square root of x times x minus 2 times x plus 3. Now, because of the square root here, it might be a little bit misleading, but really what we want to do is rewrite this in the following way. Rewrite this as x to the 1 half times x minus 2 to the 1 half times x plus 3 to the 1 half, right? All these situations. And so this tells us very quickly, okay, we have an x-intercept at 0, we have an x-intercept at 2, we have an x-intercept at negative 3, okay? Um, we then... Our multiplicities are going to look like one half in each of those situations, one half, one half, one half. Which one half is the numerator is one, 
but it's less than the, the, the multiplicity of one half is less than one. So this indicates to us that all of these ones should have this unusual steepness. Unusual steepness near their x intercepts. But there's also another thing we need to draw our attention to. We have a square root, right? And we have variables inside of square root. There could be some choices of x for which that we're taking the square root of a negative. Ah, oh, okay. So we have to actually think about it for a second. What's the domain of this thing? So we, this then comes down to solving the inequality. x times x minus 2 times x plus 3. We need this to be greater than or equal to 0. Okay? For which that leads ourselves to a number line for which we label the number line with the same markers 0, 2, and negative 3. Okay? For which we then see here that we get this... Uh, if we, if we think of the graph of this polynomial, so forget all of the powers of one half for a moment. If we think of the polynomial, each of these things have odd multiplicity, one, 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 right? Um, and this is approximately the same thing as an x cubed. So it should be pointing up on the right-hand side. It should be pointing down on the left-hand side. And then we cross the x-axis all the time. So we're going to get something like this. Notice that we're negative here, positive here, negative here, and positive here. This tells us that the domain the domain of our function g is going to be the interval negative 3 to 0 union 2 to infinity, okay? So in terms of n behavior, we actually are interested in what happens as we get close to infinity, what happens when we get close to 2, 0, and negative 3. That's what we really should be worried about here, okay? But we can answer all of those questions so that as x approaches infinity, we're going to look like the dominant term. This is going to look like y equals the square root of x times x times x. That is, this will look like x to the 3 halves. In particular, this is going to go off towards infinity. As we approach 2, let me switch to a different color. As we approach 2, our function is going to look like the square root of 2 times x minus 2 times by 3. Uh, excuse me, uh, by 5, which is 2 plus, 2 plus 3 right there. For which then we can see that, okay, this is going to look like the square root of 10 times x minus, x minus 2 to the 1 half. And so in particular, it's going to look like a square root function. So it's going to be exiting um, x equals 2 from the positive side. And so if we put that into practice here, okay, let's, let's kind of graph the information we have so far. If we were to graph this by hand, oh, let's make that look a little bit straighter. We get this, and we get this right here. So what we're saying here is that when you're at x equals 2, it should look like a standard square root. So we, it should be coming up. And then the other one says it should be approaching x equals 3 halves, for which it's steeper than a line, but it's not as steep as a parabola. So we get something that looks like the following exactly what we see here from the computer generated picture. Okay. Now what is it how does it behave near the other intercepts? Okay, cuz it only there's only going to be a we only have anything between -3 and 0. Everything else is outside the graph. Uh, so if you look at towards -3, we're going to plug -3 into all of the pieces except for x plus 3, for which case you're going to get -3 times -5 times x my, uh, x plus 3 right here, for which this is going to look like the square root of 15 times x plus 3 to the 1 half power, for which, again, that thing should look like a standard square root kind of coming up like so. And then the last one, if we consider that one as well, then we plug in 0 everywhere except for the x. So we're going to get the square root of x times, in this situation, uh, we end up with, we have a 0 minus 2, so it's going to be a negative 2 right here. And then we're going to have, uh, then we're going to have a uh, x plus three, which the x became a zero, so we're going to get a three right here. So this thing is going to look like the square root of six times, in this case, the square root of negative x, right? Now this this changes the domain, right? This thing, because of the negative sign here, it's reflected to, across in the other direction. So this should actually look like a picture that looks something like this, for which the other one looks something like this. And so when we put that together. As we put this together, we should go from 0 to negative 3. It should come up and then come back down.
right? Something like that. Now, that's not exactly what our picture has. Notice how it's a little bit more lopsided towards one side or the other. We're not going to worry about where that maximum point is right now. We're just trying to get this picture that we see right here. Okay, let's do one more example. Let's do one more example of this thing right here. H of X equals X over the cube root of X squared minus four. So what can be going on here? What do we should be paying attention to? Well, if we think about the domain, right? The domain should be of concern to us. Uh, you'll notice that in the denominator, you're gonna get the cube root of X minus two times the cube root of X plus two if we factor the denominator. And in the numerator, we have an X. So some things we could ask ourselves is, in terms of domain, well, um, since you have a cube root, there's no worry about plus versus minus, but we do it. We are dividing by zero at certain places, right? So we're gonna have we're gonna have vertical asymptotes at x equals two and at x equals negative two, right? And the multiplicities of those things are gonna be one third, right? M equals one third because of the cube root there. Um, we also have x-intercepts. Uh, and there's going to be an x-intercept at x equals 0, and its multiplicity is going to equal 1. And then the last thing I'd be kind of interested in is the end behavior, right? What's the end behavior of this thing? Because this thing, will, this, this function here will be approximated. The dominant term on top is going to be an x. The dominant term on the bottom is going to be a cube root of x squared. That is, it's going to look like x to the 3 halves, for which as x approaches infinity, I guess we should reduce that thing first down, we're gonna get one over x to the one half. And so as x approaches infinity, right, as x approaches infinity, we see that we're gonna get one over, one over, why did I write, why did I write, I have, I have my fraction upside down, I'm sorry. That was a mistake on my part, let me fix that. So you get x over two thirds, for which then when you subtract one from that, that makes a big difference on how this thing looks, right? If you take if you take x to the first minus x to the two third, that, that is minus the powers there, you're actually gonna get x to the one third, like so. And so in this situation, as x approaches infinity, we see that uh, y will approach infinity. And then as x approaches negative infinity, we see that x to the one third will approach negative infinity as well, okay? And in particular, our function will be asymptotic to this value right here. Uh, that, that is, this function will look approximately like this, uh, it'll look approximately like this x equals one third there, okay? So with that information, I think we're in a situation where we can start to look at what this graph is gonna look like. This is the final picture, right? But I want to first, uh, let's try to graph it on our own and see what's going on here. So remember this picture, we'll come back to it in just a second. Okay, let's graph this thing. I'm gonna emphasize who's the x-axis and the y-axis so we can see that here. Uh, we'll do something like this. So what information did we discover, right? So we have an x-intercept at zero. Okay, so let's mention that point. We have an x-intercept at zero, like so. Let me do that with yellow so it sticks out a little bit more. We had a vertical asymptote at two and negative two. So we'll add those onto the picture, like so. And then something like this, great. Uh, what else did we know about these things? So if we mentioned like their multiplicities, right? The multiplicity of the x-intercept was m equals one. So this will, uh, and then uh, then the multiplicities of the of the asymptotes. Uh, this makes it, this was one third. Remember. So what this why this matters for us is that we're going to cross infinity at this asymptote. We're going to cross infinity at this asymptote because the numerator here is odd. Um, we're also going to cross. We're going to cross the x-axis at our intercept. So that that part we know. We also know the end behavior that we know our end behavior that as we go off towards infinity, y will go towards infinity, and as we go towards a negative infinity, we're going to go off towards negative infinity. And so because of this information, we can actually have enough to start piecing things together. Because if we start off in this, this area over here, we know we have to go up towards, we don't have to go up towards infinity. As we approach the asymptote, we have to either go up or we go down, right? But there's no x-intercept right here, so we can't go from over here to over here. So what's going to happen is we're going to have to get something that looks like the following, right? At some point, it's going to come and bend around like so, going off towards infinity 
infinity on the right-hand side, and it will approach infinity as x goes towards uh, 2 from the right-hand side. Okay, but now we know we cross infinity, so we have to come up from the other side of the picture. Okay, uh, then we have to approach our intercept, for which at the intercept we're going to cross the x-axis, come over here. And so then as we get towards our vertical asymptote, again, we either go off towards infinity or we go off towards negative infinity. Those are the options. But if we're going to go towards negative infinity, this would require us crossing the x-axis, which we can't do that. So we're going to have to go off towards infinity in this approach. Again, since we cross the horizontal, or since we cross the vertical asymptote, we're going to have to wrap around from the other side. And then we have to get towards negative infinity, right? We can't go too far up. We're going to have to wrap around and do something like this. All right, and so that then gives us our picture when we use the multiplicities of our intercepts and our vertical asymptotes here. So let's try to compare these. Can I put these on the same on the same picture right there? Uh, you can see our hand drawn one versus the computer animated one, and yeah, it's pretty good. We're able to find all of this information using the asymptotics of our graph.